I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 6. Luke 6 is our text. And uh, if uh, you don't have a Bible with you and you're in the room, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1025 and you'll be able to follow along. You'll be in Luke chapter 6. And uh, as always, if you're in the room and you don't have a Bible and you want one, take one. Just take it with you when you leave. We, that's why they're in the, the seats for you to use and for you to take as you need. So we want you to have a Bible and read the Bible. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, uh, message us and we will deliver one to you or we will mail one to you because we want everyone to have a Bible so they can read and apply God's Word because if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. It's not a theory, it's a fact, and it will happen. So, uh, hey, what was the worst possible thing you could hear your parents say when you were growing up? Okay, uh, lean over, tell your neighbor. Uh, you only have about 10, 15 seconds to do this. So go ahead and tell them. Worst possible thing you could hear your parents say. Come on, think about it. Most of you have been in therapy for this already, so <laughs> should be really easy. Just go ahead and tell them. This is one of those questions that you want to enjoy in life group, uh, you know, this week when you meet. Say, hey, what was the worst thing you could have heard? Okay, it's not one of your questions that's written there, but it's one you should talk about. So growing up, here's the things I didn't like, and, and all of them weren't what they said, but um, I didn't like the sound of my dad removing his belt. <laughs> Say, some of you have PTSD at that sound like I do, right? You know, he always wore those, you know, kind of dress pants and had those thin belts, and it just kind of made that whoosh sound like a, you're snapping a whip when he took it off. Uh, so, uh, but that wasn't the worst. I, I hated being told and hearing that I was grounded. I spent half my teen years grounded. It's like, come on, go ahead and whoop me and get it over with, all right? I'll take the, you know, short time of pain so I can have some freedom, but no, don't, don't make me stay here with you. Um, isn't that what we all felt, uh, teenagers? Okay. I, I, I hated hearing them say, on a Saturday morning, today we're going to clean out the garage. Because that just meant that the whole day was blown up no good. Because, I mean, we always had a big garage. We never parked cars in it. It was full of stuff. And I mean, we had to take every bit of stuff out of the garage and then sweep out the garage and then hose out the garage and then put back the semi-hoarding amount of things into the garage in exactly the order that they were in before. And uh, it was just like the complete waste of a day. And my soul died a little bit every time they said, uh, by the way, you'll never hear me say, hey, it's Saturday. We should clean out the garage. Uh, I still need therapy for that. But the worst... The very worst thing that I could hear my parents say, you broke our trust. You disappointed us. Um, I was 11 years old. I was babysitting my little brother. He was sleeping, and I accidentally locked myself out of the house. Uh, now, it was my parents' fault because they had those doors that locked behind you automatically. And uh, so, but it didn't matter uh, that I was, uh, uh, I broke their trust, and I wasn't allowed to do that anymore. Uh, I broke their trust when at 14, as a high school freshman, I went with the seniors on senior ditch day to the Salt River in Phoenix, and I was that close to getting away with it, but my stupid brother brought me home three hours late. Uh, so, uh, you know, I got the lecture, I got the grounded for life, uh, and uh, I, I broke their trust. See, trust is such a valuable commodity. It can take years to earn it and can be lost in an instant. So today, we are beginning a series called Entrusted. Entrusted. God has entrusted us. He's entrusted us with life and with relationships. He's entrusted us with the mission of the gospel and leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. He's entrusted us with time and talents and resources. So we spent the month of August and part of September talking about relationships that God had entrusted us in a marriage series. And then we spent several months talking about our mission and who we are as Calvary and, and, the, and the responsibility to carry out that mission that God has given to us as a church and how we're going to do that and how we're going to live doing that. 
And, and so beginning now in the series Entrusted, we're going to lean into the resources that God has entrusted us because it all matters. God wants you to have a great family relationship because that is a testimony to the world that he makes a difference. And the best blessings start at home. And, and then God wants the church to be functional and, and effective in the gospel ministry, his mission. And, and we want to see that happen. And, and God wants us to deal with our issues around money and resources and all those things that he has entrusted to us. Because if we don't get that piece right, it's going to prevent us from living in the joy and freedom that God intends his children to live in. So we're going to talk about it for the next few weeks. Uh, and, and today, I want to talk about the big picture. How, how do we think about the resources that have been entrusted to us? Again, because we struggle with these things. So here's, here's the big picture. First of all, I just want to tell you that God owns everything. God owns everything. If you knew this, great. If you didn't, then guess what? God owns it all. Psalm 24.1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. Did you get that? The earth is the Lord's and everything that's in it. How about that? It all belongs to him. The people that are in it. Guess what? They belong to him too. All of us belong to God. We're his. This is the reality. God, by the way, if, if you grew up in church, you know this, because Genesis 1-1 says what? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Hey, look, if you're the maker, you're the owner. So God's the creator. He's the owner of everything that is. So if you believe in God, if you're a follower of Jesus, and by follower of Jesus, I mean that you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world. You believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then, then you belong to him, and you probably already understand that the Bible clearly defines God as the owner of everything. Now, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, in fact, if you're not part of Calvary and you're just here checking it out, and you're going, oh, great, I showed up to check out the church and they're talking about money. Oh, I don't want to hear this. Uh, can I just encourage you, if you're a follower of Jesus, you probably want to know what Jesus said about money. You probably want to know what he's teaching, uh, the Bible teaches about resources and what we've been entrusted with. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, uh, I really want you to listen and pay attention because I want you to be surprised by what God has to say. And, and if you're checking out Calvary and you're like, yeah, okay, uh, then I, I really want to encourage you because you may hear some things a little bit differently than you've heard before in other churches, other places. And so I, I just want to encourage you not to tune out simply because money is part of what we're talking about because God owns it all. Okay, God owns it all. And because God owns it all, God gave you everything good in your life. God gave you everything that's good in your life. The Apostle James, chapter 1, verse 17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no shifting shadow. Did you catch that? Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. So that means if it's good in your life, who gave it to you? Right. Now, it's easy to say that. We're in church. You know the answers. You know the church answers. It's like, yeah, okay, God gave it to me. Let, let me just go ahead and, and just break this down a little bit for us. Because sometimes it helps us to, to think through the details, not just the big statements. That means that your salvation, the fact that you are forgiven from sins, the fact that God has poured out his grace on you and you get heaven when you deserve hell, the fact that you have eternal life, this is a gift from God. That's good, isn't it? Every good gift is from God. So, he's given you that. That means your spouse, the one you currently have, you know, because the, the exes maybe you wouldn't feel so good about. Your spouse, your children, your grandchildren. I get an amen there because you guys, don't, you, know, that's, you know that's good. Your friends, all of the people in your life that you, that matter to you, that you enjoy, that you love being with, that you value, Look, Jesus gave you those people. Okay. 
How many of you like to laugh? Yeah, laughter. It's a gift from God. Play is a gift from God. A lot of people in church forget that. In fact, this, this week we're hosting the Arizona Southern Baptist Convention, and on Thursday, the convention is Thursday, Friday. On Thursday, we invited a bunch, all the pastors in the state to come up here, and we said, hey, we're going to take you out, and we're going to play. It's a day of play, because we know you guys are terrible at play. We didn't tell them that. We just are convicted by that. And, and, and it's true. I grew up in church where nobody ever talked about play. No one ever said play is a good thing. But what do we call it? Recreation. Spell out recreation. You know what it spells? Recreation. Come on, God's the one who invented it and gave it to us. Sports. Oh, you guys like sports? Any kind of sport. I'm not just talking about team sports that you can. You guys are like, you guys like to laugh a whole lot more than you like sports. Man. Okay. Anyway, sports are a gift from God. Your energy, not your energy drinks, but your energy, your uh, health, all of it is a gift from God. It's good. And, and so, therefore, God gave it to you. How about your job, your career, your talent, your creativity, your abilities? God is the one who blessed you with all of those things. How about your house, your car, your boat, your side-by-side, your motorhome, your motorcycle? Guess what? Your father from above gave those to you. How about your 401K, your retirement, your income, your investments? Guess what? Every good gift in your life comes from God. God has given you all the good in your life. After all, he's the owner of all of it, and he's the one who has blessed you with it. But do we think through that, or do we start thinking, hey, you know what? It's mine. I worked for it. I invested wisely. I sacrificed and saved. Or maybe you just had wealthy parents. Maybe. Guess what? I understand. You worked for it. You invested. You earned. You sacrificed. You saved. But who gave you the life? Who gave you the energy? Who gave you the ability? Who gave you the wisdom? (laughs) Who gave you the rich parents? You didn't choose them. See, God gave it to you. We need to understand that, that not only does God own everything, but God is the one who's responsible for blessing us with it. If we don't get that, then the whole rest of it doesn't make any sense either. So God has entrusted it all to you. He has not entrusted it all for you. But he has entrusted it to you. So what are you doing with it? What are you doing with it? Hey, for the record, uh, please know here at Calvary, we believe that God doesn't need your money. God doesn't need your money. He, he, he really doesn't. After all, he's the one who gave it to you. He doesn't need it back from you. He's the one who owns everything. Uh, so, you know, he's kind of loaning it to you. He's entrusting it to you. He doesn't need it from you. This is important to understand. God's not running out. He created the heavens and the earth from nothing. I think he can get by till payday. He's not broke, and he's not, you know, close to it. God has all the resources for his kingdom's work. He doesn't need your money ever. And the church belongs to Jesus, so the church doesn't need your money. Some of you are like, oh, I hadn't heard that before. I know this freaks some people out in different ways. First time I said this from the pulpit, which was years ago, the chairman of stewardship just about had a stroke. He's like, don't tell them that. Why do you have to emphasize that? Can't you just go ahead and, you know, uh, you let, it, let them think that, you know, you, that, that, come on. Can't, you don't have to emphasize that so much, do you? Um, now, other people are shocked because all their life, churches and pastors and ministries have, have said the church needs you to give or our doors are going to close. Church needs you to give or this ministry is going to close. We need you to give. And they'll pass the offering plate. And, and I've been there when they looked at it and said, that's not enough. They'll pass it again. Anybody else been there? They did that? Yeah. And you're like, uh, I don't think so. It's uncomfortable. It's awkward. But it's, I'm just telling you, there's a lot of people who, don't, who wouldn't agree with that. And that's okay because I don't agree with them saying the church needs your money because of biblical convictions that I have. Let me tell you why. Okay, biblical convictions. Number, number one, the church is described in two pictures in the New Testament. The first one is the body of Christ. 
Okay, the church is the body of Christ. Jesus is called the head, and we are the members. Everyone who is a believer in Jesus is part of the body of Christ. So we're members of the body. We're the hands, we're the feet, we're the eyes, we're the nose, we're the mouth. Some of us are other body parts. Um, so uh, uh, anyway, so, you know, we're part of the body of Christ. Now think about this. Jesus is the head. He's not going to let his body starve, is he? No. Now, on the other hand, he doesn't want his body to be fat and lazy either. That's why he sends us on mission. He's got something for us to do. So the church is the body of Christ, and the church is pictured as the bride of Christ. Jesus marries the church. In case you hadn't read this or didn't know this, uh, you know, husbands are told to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's the picture of the marriage relationship is Jesus and the church. That's how men are supposed to love their, their wives. In, in Revelation, there is a wedding feast when the church is brought together at the end, brought together with Jesus, and, and we consummate the relationship in some spiritual way where we're all there together with our Savior. Now, that, that's the picture in the scriptures of our relationship with Jesus. So if the groom is rich and they get married, and, and there's nowhere in the Bible where it talks about prenups, then, uh, then the bride is wealthy too, right? So uh, if Jesus owns the church and the church belongs to him, then guess what? The church never need your money. It just is a biblical impossibility to say, hey, we, we really need you to give or else we're going to go broke or else we're going to have to shut the doors or we're going to have to do whatever. And, and some of you are hearing this for the first time and you're really liking Calvary about now. <laughs> you're like, this church? Is that, yeah. Uh, now, a lot of you have been here uh, for a while and you know what I'm about to say. You know what I'm about to illustrate. And, and uh, some of you are like nodding and like, yeah, okay. Setting them up. <laughs> it's true. I am. But that's okay. Followers of Jesus need to give generously. Followers of Jesus need to give abundantly. We need to give insanely. We need to give. Okay, Luke chapter 6. See, some of you thought I was never going to get to the text, didn't you? This is a verse, verse 38. I want you to underline. I want you to star. I want you to memorize. I want you to, you know, make copies and print it out and put it all around you because it is a life-changing verse when you apply it to your life. Jesus says, give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, there's a weird part in the middle that we don't really get because when they talked about measured, they were talking, they were an agrarian society. They were talking about grain and things like that. And so pressed down, shaken together as you take the, the bushel and you shake it and you get all the grain to settle so that it, you get the most in there and you fill it up to the top and everything. So, you know, it's that, it's that picture. But the, listen to what he says when you take out the, the, the agrarian picture. Give and it will be given to you for with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Give, and it will be given to you, for with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. This is the principle, the biblical principle of reciprocity. That you are going to reap what you sow. By the way, we encourage you to read the Bible if you missed that earlier. And, and if you read Scripture, you will find this principle of reciprocity from the beginning to the end that you are going to reap what you sow in every aspect of life. In your family, you're going to reap what you sow. On the mission, you're going to reap what you sow. And financially, you're going to reap what you sow. Okay, that, that's just reality. Uh, Galatians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul says, don't be deceived. God cannot be mocked. Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. If he sows to the flesh, he will from the flesh reap destruction. And if he sows to the Spirit, he will from the Spirit reap eternal life. You're going to reap what you sow. Jesus expressed this in the Sermon on the Mount, in the Beatitudes, when he said, blessed are the merciful. Because if you're merciful, what are you going to receive? Mercy, yeah. If you're merciful, you're going to receive mercy. And, and then... Uh, 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, the Apostle Paul goes on to say, talking about money, he says, if you sow generously, you'll reap generously. And if you sow uh, sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. You're going to reap what you sow. And that's what Jesus is applying that principle to. And he's applying it to giving, to generosity. Now, this has been abused. This has been taught all kinds of crazy ways. I want to illustrate something for you that I think will help you understand this a little bit better. And if it doesn't, see me afterwards. I'll give you your money back. Okay? So, let's just say, I don't know why this is making noise, but anyway, let's just say that uh, you're going to have me over to your house for ice cream. Now, if you are new here and you don't understand, ice cream is one of my vices. And uh, see, you guys already know what I like. Chocolate peanut butter is my flavor of choice. And let's just say that you, you say, hey, Pastor Chad, I have the world's best chocolate peanut butter ice cream at my house, and I want you to come over and have some. I'll say yes, okay? That's a given. And you say, but I'm a little bit weird, especially with all this COVID stuff and all these germs and everything like that. So um, uh, I, I'm, it's, it's homemade, and I'm going to serve it up to you, but you got to bring your own bowl, and, and you only get one serving because we're not going to do seconds. I'm like, okay, you, you, at your house, you have the right to be weird, right? <laughs> and I don't care because I like ice cream. So I'm coming, and i got to bring my own bowl. I am not going to show up with this bowl. <laughs> I don't even know why these bowls exist. This looks like, you know, maybe a salsa bowl if you're going to eat three chips or something. But, um, you know, there, uh, fancy hotels and stuff have desserts in these kind of size dishes. I think that's a waste of everything. Uh, but uh, so I'm not going to show up with that kind of bowl. And, and I'm not going to show up with a perfectly good ice cream bowl. Isn't this cute? This is the kind of bowl my wife likes to buy. I, it, you know, and it's so cute because it's a little ice cream cone shaped thing. And, uh, and the reality is I've never eaten ice cream out of this because this bowl is not big enough. So I'm not showing up with that. Uh, I could show up with my normal ice cream bowl. Uh, just a cheap plastic uh, bowl, but you can mound it really good. It holds it in there. But uh, you said I could only have one serving. I can't go back for seconds, so I'm not going to use that bowl. Now, I could show up with a cereal bowl, that, you know, the kind that you can put half a box in and uh, eat a lot. And I'm like, yeah, that would hold a lot. I'd probably be enough. But what if your ice cream is so good I want a lot? Then I might show up with something like this, right? Good old mixing bowl. Now, see this, you could put a pint in this. You could do the whole half gallon in this thing. But you said it's homemade, and as you said, you're, you're, you're throwing down like it's the best ever. So I'm just going to tell you, I'm showing up with this bowl. Okay? You said I can have one serving. Here we go. Fill it up. And by the way, just for the record, I have eaten ice cream out of this bowl. I confess, and it's real. Uh, and yes, I might have regretted it afterwards. She so go, okay, that's really funny. It's a really stupid illustration. What, is, what are you really trying to get at? Uh, what I'm getting is this. Give, and it will be given to you. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, this, there's an amazing concept here. Because what God is saying is that you and I get to choose what size uh, what the amount of blessings we get. Given it will be given to you. The measure you use will be measured back to you. And, and in my mind, what happens in our Christian life is that there's a lot of us who are saying, God, why won't you pour out more blessings on my life? Everyone around me is more blessed. And because we're sitting here holding this tiny little cheap crap bowl. <laughs> right? And, and look, God is not running out of blessings. He's pouring them out in your life. And we're standing there going, how come they have more blessings than me? Because we're holding this bowl, and they're holding this bowl. And we're like, why are they more blessed than me? I don't know. Maybe because you're cheap. <laughs> maybe because you're not, you know, letting God bless you. And the truth is, if, if, with this principle, we don't want this bowl. We want a 55-gallon drum. Right? Because you want to bring the biggest possible bowl if God's offering up the blessings. And God is offering up the blessings, and we get to decide how much blessings we want. 
See, when I say, look, we need to give generously, insanely, crazily, I mean it because we want to be blessed. And, and, and we read this, and then we go, that's not how it works. That's how it works. I mean, you can either just go, well, Jesus didn't know what he's talking about, or you can say, I need to rethink how I approach this whole subject of generosity because I want more blessings. I need to bring a bigger bowl. Now, some of you right now uh, are thinking, well, then, uh, it, this is a financial investment strategy, not a principle of blessing. So let me just go ahead and clarify something for everyone that, that is here. We get to determine the amount of blessings in our life God gets to determine the type of blessings in our life. Let me be really clear. God does not work like an ATM or, uh, you know, any kind of gambling or investment. Uh, investment is just a fancy word for gambling uh, with big money. Uh, it, look, God doesn't work that way. We get to determine how much blessing. God gets to determine what type of blessing that we're going to receive. Because he's smarter than us and he knows us better. So let me be real, really, really, again, really just direct. Most of us in this room, if left to our own devices, we want the worst blessings possible. You go, what are the worst blessings possible? The ones that don't last. We want money. Ah, oh, if I just had more money. God, let me, let me win the lottery. God, let me get a raise. God, let me have this, you know. And we, so we want more money because we think money's going to make everything better. And, and so we're asking God to bless us with money. And guess what, folks? You can't take it with you. I mean, there's warnings about the love of money in Scripture, so uh, we're not going to go there. But, but, I mean, money is just, it's just temporary. Do you not understand that you are a co-heir with Jesus for everything that exists? You are not poor. God is not running out of resources. You have enough. Problem is that we're not good stewards with what God's given us. That's why we have Dave Ramsey classes, because some of us need those. Okay, so, you know, we want money. And, you, you know, like this is how important money is in heaven. <laughs> the streets are paved with gold. The most valuable metal in this world is asphalt in heaven. It's just not important. It's not important. It makes really cool streets, but it's not important. The, the other thing that we ask God to bless us with is what? Health. Right? We're always praying that someone will be healed. And I pray for people to be healed all the time. Healing is cool when it happens. We want to be healthy so that we can die healthy. <laughs> you guys do understand you're not getting out alive, right? I know some of you are like, oh, but if Jesus comes back before I die, yes. And every generation of Christians since the first one has been waiting for Jesus to come back so they didn't have to die. And that's why the writer of Hebrews says, it's appointed unto people once to die and then judgment. Okay, so that's why we got to know Jesus because he takes care of the judgment part. But you're not getting out alive. You're going to die. You might die healthy or you might die sick. You're going to die. Okay, so be ready for it. But we, we, we pray for people to get healthy. That's temporary. They're going to get perfect. We pray for more money, but we're already rich in eternity. What are the blessings that really last? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The fruit of the Holy Spirit in your life. Having relationships that are healthy and growing and dynamic being used by God to see life change happen and knowing that the God of the universe spoke through you, worked through you, touched through you, loved through you. See, you talk about life change. That's the blessings that last. In fact, when God uses you to lead someone else to a life-changing relationship with Jesus, that lasts an eternity. See, we get to determine the amount of blessings. God determines the type of blessing. But the question is, what size bowl are you bringing to God for the blessings? Let's just take it back to what Jesus said. Give, and it will be given to you. For the measure you use 
will be measured back to you. So if you want more blessings in your life, which I'm pretty sure everyone does, then ask God to help you be more generous. Practice greater generosity toward God and toward others. Let your, let your life be a generous life. Not because you have to, but because you realize it's wise and because you want to be like God who owns everything and gives it away. Now, on a practical level, what does that mean? Well, that means that I challenge you to talk to God and ask God uh, how you can be more generous. Does God want you to be more generous? In what way could you be more generous? Look, we obviously take up an offering here. We don't pass the plate. There's offering boxes on the walls. We mention them every single service. How do we mention them? If you're a guest, we want you to drop a, a Connect card in the offering box. That's your gift to us. We don't want your money if you're a guest. Okay? Now, if you're listening and you go, I want more blessings, then you figure that out. But you can give to Calvary. Every dollar you drop in that offering box, we use in Ministry of Life Change here in Havasu, in Parker, to the ends of the earth. We give away 20% of what you give. We just It's going to other people, blessing other people, other places, missionaries, and, and all. So we're practicing what we preach. We're trying to be as generous as we can. Okay, that, that's, that's reality. So give to Calvary. You want to, you go, no, I, I, Pastor, you don't understand. I want to, I want to give like big. Okay, we, we just bought a, or got given a Parker campus, and we got to raise a bunch of money so we can uh, fix it up. I believe God's going to provide that. We need at least a half a million dollars. And if you're writing a check, that's five zeros. This campus, this beautiful campus we're meeting in and, and, and all, we still owe almost $2 million on it. We paid down a whole bunch in just uh, five years. And, and so, you know, uh, that's six zeros, by the way. And, uh, you know, hey, if, if, here's my thing. If we actually understood this and we all said, I'm going to bring a bigger bowl, guess what? Wouldn't it be cool if in 12 months we just paid all that off? See, those are the kinds of things that we need to have conversation with God, but it's not like one or two people writing a big check. It's about all of us saying, I want a bigger bowl. I want to see God work in my life. And what about the people in your life? What about the people around you? You know, are, are you looking for those to bless? We're going to give you a lot of opportunities coming up on Christmas season to bless people, people that you'll never meet, people you'll never see. And, and, and yet we're going to have angel trees and we're going to have Christmas backpacks for uh, kids on reservations and on the border. And, and, and we're just going to give you opportunities to bless in amazing ways. But to do this, it means that we actually understand. We understand what God has entrusted to us and we understand the wisdom of a bigger bowl. So God doesn't need our money. Never has, never will. The church belongs to Jesus, doesn't need your money either. But you and I, as children of God, need to give generously. And here's the thing. It'll change your life if you believe and apply the words of Jesus. And he's the one who said give, and it will be given to you. For the measure you use will be measured back to you. Let's pray. Father, your generosity is incredible. That you would love us in our rebellion, in our defiance, in, in our rejection of you as Lord. Yet you loved us and sent Jesus into this world who sacrificed himself as a payment for our sins. And God, we know that we are hopeless without you. So today we simply yield to you. God, you know the, the, the stubbornness in our hearts. You know how we love to hold on to the things that you have given to us. So I pray that you would simply work in our hearts and minds right now, that your spirit would move in this room, and you would affirm, encourage, convict, challenge, and change us so that we can live life in your blessings, abundantly overflowing, because we understand your truth. Jesus, thanks for loving us. Thanks for being patient with us. Thanks for persevering with us even when we are greedy and selfish. You still love us and you call us to life change. So right now, we surrender. In Jesus' name, amen.